Good morning. If you're waiting in the parking lot, you can come on in. We'll be starting our worship service in about four minutes. If you're listening at home, we are glad that you can join us uh, through this means in these complicated times. Uh, I have two special announcements that I'll go ahead and make now. One, uh, in addition to the prayers uh, and the individuals that we pray for that are already printed in your bulletin, we had Bonnie Boss to that list. She had uh, some emergency surgery on Friday and is recuperating very well from that. Uh, the second announcement is that in three weeks at the next church council meeting, and I'm aiming mostly at people on the camera, but you know, I'm telling everybody it's not a secret. And in three weeks uh, at our next uh, church council meeting, uh, the church council will be uh, undertaking a question about buying some uh, new equipment, which will make our internet streaming version of the church service um, a little bit higher quality, um, a little bit uh, easier, and a little bit more reliable. And those are three things that uh, would help us. So if you're at home and have been contemplating uh, a thing to write a special check about, or if you uh, have memorial funds that uh, you might be interested in designating, uh, let one of the church council members know. Uh, because uh, the availability of funds might uh, affect our decisions uh, that we need to make in three weeks. Our service will begin in about two minutes.
for worship services from the second Sunday after Pentecost. A special welcome to all of you who are worshiping both here in si on site and uh, through the internet, wherever you may be uh, around the world. Uh, a reminder that we have a great supply preacher lined up in the next two weeks, and I invite you to uh, be here and, and get a great dose of uh, 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 scripture-inspired message. Uh, I'll be back with you in three weeks, and Froggy is coming out of pandemic retirement in three weeks. Uh, we don't want to add to the overall service time, uh, since we know that time and proximity are, are the two great variables that uh, affect virus transmission. Uh, but Froggy Time is going to come back to us uh, starting at 10 minutes before the service in part of that warm-up time, and then it can go out on the video feed and it won't extend the duration of our service to those of you on site. Uh, I'll be gone so that I can go home and get a root canal, yay, and uh, spend the weekend with uh, my the, the family I grew up with, my, my brothers and my, and my step siblings and, and mom all back at the family farm. And uh, I couldn't help but think of them as the Wisdoms came in this morning and, and sat down because it, it is a powerful sign of maturity when a family crosses the threshold between, so that parents can sit next to each other in worship, that you don't have to have that divided, you know, bookend kind of thing so that you can control your children, that your daughters are so well behaved, that, that they don't need, you know, one-on-one -on -one management. Uh, as for my brothers, we're, you know, 55, 51, and whatever 51 minus 4 is, you know, mom still has to stay within distance of the rolling pin when we get together. So uh, we are blessed to have such well-behaved kids in our congregation. Let us begin our worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God of mercy, when this world seems overrun by the evil that surrounds us, remind us that your Son, Jesus, has conquered evil and death and triumphed over all. Help us to confront the evil that can reside within us and turn it over to your transformative grace and mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that apart from Christ, we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you in our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake, forgives us all our sins. By the authority of Christ himself, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
portions of Psalm 119. You are my portion, O Lord. I have promised to obey your words. I have sought your face with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. I have considered my ways, and I have turned my steps to your statutes. I will hasten and not delay to obey your commands. Though the wicked bind me with ropes, I will not forget your law. At midnight I rise to give you thanks for your righteous laws. I am a friend to all who fear you, to all who follow your precepts. The earth is filled with your love, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. First reading is from the 44th chapter of Isaiah. This is what the Lord says. Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord Almighty, I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people and what is yet to come. Yes, let him foretell what will come. Do not tremble, do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witness. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Second reading is from the eighth chapter of Romans. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. <coughs> we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you to stand as you wish for the Gospel. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. When he left the crowd and went into the house, his disciples came to him and asked, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. The Gospel of the Lord. All of you may be seated, but I 
invite Cindy uh, Ellis Newsom to please come forward. And I'm going to ask you to stand roughly here, but you and I will both look over at Tim for cues. Because we want all the folks at home to meet our new members. Up a step. Up more steps. Here. Now go up some more. One more. There you go. <laughs> Cindy, we are blessed that you have chosen to join this congregation and that you have uh, undertaken the work of preparation and studying uh, the Lutheran Catechism and the things that we believe and confess. Uh, I have a simple question for you. Are you prepared to invest uh, your heart, your passion, your time of prayer, and your patience into this community of believers? If so, answer, I do. Congregation, I ask you, are you equally excited to welcome into our midst another believer in Jesus Christ who joins with us in the work that we as a community are called to undertake? If so, answer, we do. Cindy, I'm omitting the handshake. We'll do an imaginary fist bump. Save the handshake for another time. And uh, I join the rest of the congregation in giving thanks for your membership. <laughs> Even as Cindy has undertaken to study what it is that makes us distinct in our beliefs, we are reminded of the most uh, simple form of our statement of belief, which is the Apostles' Creed, which we now confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. committee 
knows they have to work harder because I've been here too long, all right? But that construction project has been going on even longer. Uh, they weren't exactly talking about Highway 152 uh, in the article, so it was written several years ago. Uh, but they gave examples of other places that I've seen around the world, places like uh, Nairobi and New Delhi, because it's not so much the, the geography of the roundabout that makes it in so many places just a horrible mess, it's the social constructs that are necessary for the roundabout to work. So uh, eventually, I'm sure, that Highway 152 overpass will be finished. And hopefully, over time, everyone will get used to what they're supposed to do when the lanes are clearly marked. But if you go to a place like New Delhi, you'll see these giant roundabouts where five lanes of traffic going through in one direction intersect three or four lanes of traffic coming from the sides. And I say lanes of traffic because if you look down at the highway, you would see markers on the pavement as if that's where the lanes were. But nobody cares what the little white stripes on the black asphalt say. I mean, if that road is wide enough to hold seven cars, then there's going to be a width of seven cars at that intersection, regardless of what the little stripes say. And there will be motorcycles weaving in and out between those seven cars, those places where there's a width greater than a box of matches between the two sets of cars. And so when those folks all nudge up to the roundabout, they all just keep creeping forward. There's no smooth transition. They just push and push and push and honk and it, 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 it's just chaos. I mean, it, it, they'd be better off with uh, stoplights because the, the culture just doesn't embrace that idea of something that is almost like an yield in our traffic laws, but not quite the same as a yield, where you're supposed to slow down, but everyone is just supposed to cooperate and let all the traffic move as it needs to. So again, the problem isn't that these roundabouts haven't been beautifully designed by a civil engineer somewhere. The problem is the social views of the people that are trying to use them. And Brits, they behave very well at their roundabouts. But in many other parts of the world, people don't. And in order for the roundabout to work, you both have to know what you're supposed to do, and you have to be expecting every other car to do the right thing. So what makes it work or not work is what we are expecting. I had a Zoom call on Wednesday night this week with uh, the Luther Church in South Sudan and uh, a bunch of folks who have set up medical missions, worked with their university, some like me, who worked with the seminary, and uh, it was just an update on circumstances there and how their ministry is uh, moving forward uh, despite the pandemic and, and some other challenges. And uh, the president of the Lutheran Church of South Sudan uh, mentioned a sermon that I preached four or five years ago. And I, I honestly do not remember this sermon. So I was taking his word for it. But he mentioned a couple things that I'd said in the sermon. And it was like, wow, I'm glad somebody remembered uh, a sermon that I preached years ago. And then he thought about, uh, mentioned the Greek that I taught while I was there that uh, there was a, a whole new group of professors or students and there were not enough professors. And uh, so in the, the couple of weeks that I was there, in addition to uh, preaching and, and helping with the, the graduation for their uh, outgoing first class, uh, none of the students there in the three plus years of seminary had ever had any so all the students were together in one giant introduction to the Greek class. And I felt great sympathy for those students. Be 
because um, I am not proficient in Greek. I mean, I was proficient enough to pass seminary three decades ago, but uh, I, uh, I am not expert in Greek, and I didn't keep up with Greek. And if you don't keep doing weekly translating, it, it, it just fades once you get to a, a certain age. And so, uh, you know, I was just I was struck with sadness thinking again about those poor students. Fortunately, the first two weeks, pretty much all you have to do is explain to people the alphabet and the basic parts of speech. And so that much I could do. That much most fraternity or sorority graduates could do. But we got through. But because of the fact that Greek is not one of my stellar ministry strengths that I can lean on, uh, you will recall over the course of the past year that there haven't been lots and lots of sermons where I've paused to explain a Greek or Hebrew word in detail. Because if I did that, I'd have to be looking it up in the book. All right? That is just not my core expertise. I know enough to pay attention to the context and the general structure, but uh, not, not off the top of my head. But this was one of those rare weeks where I found it necessary uh, to dig into the Greek for one particular word because it is so central to the passage. Uh, the word in, in Greek is um, elpizomen. It's found in verse 25 of our Romans reading. And it is translated in most of the English translations uh, in the world today as we hope. And for the sake of Bible translation, uh, I have no quibble with any of the translators. A, because they know more Greek than I do. But B, I understand a little bit of their challenge in that uh, a translator has to get the, the most accurate possible sense of each word, but they also have to construct a sentence that's readable. And uh, a lot of St. Paul's sentences in the original Greek, they were barely readable in Greek. St. Paul loved the run-on sentence that, you know, that went on for a whole page. And if you pause and make each one of those words a, a three or four word phrase to get the fullest sense of it, you, you, you know, you have to break each sentence up into eight sentences. And then you start to lose the overall sense of the passage. So, hope is a fine and beautiful word to use in our Bible translations. It's great if you're devotionally just moving through a book of the Bible and pausing to pray about it, and then you're going to move on to the next book tomorrow. That's, that's great. But if you really want to dig into this passage, it's helpful to know literally what, what Paul was saying here. Because uh, we hope is not inaccurate, but the fullest sense of the Greek is we are expecting. Now, we are expecting could certainly fall within our sense. I am expecting. I am expecting is, is a more deeper and focused sense of hope. I am expecting means it's not sort of a, a blind or random hope, but it's a very particular hope. It's a hope with a very high level of confidence behind it. And that is what Paul is suggesting to us today from across the centuries. And so with that in mind, I today would just like you to think about this Romans passage, to reflect on it in your own lives in the weeks to come. Uh, but let me just read through it and highlight a few things. First of all, uh, it's helpful to remember that because of Paul's crazy run on sentences and just because of the ways that uh, Koine Greek was written down in old texts, uh, paragraph breaks are almost completely up to the translator. And so in, uh, in many of your Bibles, and as you find it printed in our, our bulletin today, uh, you see uh, no breaks. This is just one paragraph. But a lot of translators split it in three parts. 
and I'm going to do that for us today. So the first portion is verses 18 through 21. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. Again, that's a sense of hope and confidence that something is going to happen. This glory has not yet, as Paul is writing, been fully revealed to God's faithful people, but Paul speaks confidently that it will in the future. For the creation waits, present tense, in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Paul gives us a wonderfully powerful undergirding of all of our New Testament theology. But that doesn't mean that every verse that Paul says can be read as speaking to every theological question that we have. In verses 20 and 21, a single sentence uh, together, that they certainly hint at some of that challenge. Look at just some of the things that uh, you could maybe run off on a little too far on a tangent with if you took too narrowly or, or applied from the narrow wording to broadly to lots of theological situations. There are certainly times when Paul talks about particular consequences for particular sins. Right? Plenty of other places, including the Book of Romans, uh, where Paul talks about uh, bad things and people's bad choices or, or bad decisions. He says, don't, don't make those bad choices to avoid bad things. But then, here in verse 20, Paul says that the creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice, so not just because we did stupid stuff that we are suffering, or sinful or willfully disobedient stuff, but by the will of the one who subjected it. So, sometimes bad things happen or things that we perceive as bad happen out of God's overall plan. Sometimes bad things happen because we brought them upon ourselves. And therein lies so much of the wisdom of the Gospels of us not being called to judge other people, certainly not being called to judge them just because good or bad things are happening in their lives. We look then at the next paragraph which starts in verse 22 and runs through 25. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. The whole creation has been groaning. Does that sound like the year 2020 summed up in a single verse? It certainly does, at least a little bit. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Again, it's complicated to keep track of all the verbs, but here Paul is talking about in this hope. So he's talking present tense. We were saved, past tense. Jesus has already done this. We still maintain the hope today in our own hearts. It's a present reality, but it's a present reality based on a past act that Jesus Christ has already accomplished on the cross, of course. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have. Indeed, if you drill deeper into that word of, about expecting, we are expecting, um, you weren't expecting something that's already happened. All right, you know, when a couple um, are have a due date and they're planning and they're painting the nursery and they're all excited and, and uh, you 
Pregnancy is a time of expecting. Now, once your kids are teenagers, you don't say that we are expecting. Unless you maybe say that we are expecting, there's other jobs to expect. Come on. Head nods to that? Yes, yes, yes. So Paul is just reminding us that it, it, it's not this hope thing if it's something you already have. If it's something you're already seeing, experiencing, that doesn't mean that we don't get glimpses of the great hope that we have in Jesus Christ. But the full realization of that, this side of either Judgment Day or our own death and rebirth, we're only getting hints of it. It's the expectation of that that we go through in our entire lives. But if we hope, or a little bit deeper in the Greek, if we are expecting for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Patiently is an interesting word there. Because it's kind of a descriptor of individuals and their responses. And, and not everyone uh, in the world, not everyone in a single room like this, is equally blessed with that attitude of patience. But Paul uses it to describe all of us who believe in Jesus Christ, because patiently is the only way that we can wait for the full realization of God's glory. Final paragraph. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. Again, present tense. We're still talking about a future hope, but the Spirit helps us today in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless prayer. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes, again, present tense, right now, today when we pray, for God's people, in accordance with the will of God. There's so much to think about, and advise you to do so in this coming week. But particularly keep thinking about hope. Hope's a beautiful word. Hang on to that. Use that in your devotional thoughts. But just remember what kind of hope it is. This isn't lottery ticket hope. This is complete confidence. This is what we are expecting. Amen.
I invite you to stand for the prayers. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord, in your mercy, we give you thanks for the gift and the power to hope. We pray that the Holy Spirit would stir up in each of us uh, a genuine hope, a true expectation of those promises which you made to us in Scripture. Allow each of us to cling to that hope when the troubles of this world seem overwhelming. Lord, in your mercy. We continue to pray, Lord, for every area of the world that is uh, complicated uh, in these difficult days. Uh, we especially lift up uh, missions work, which is uh, dreadfully complicated in so many parts of the world because of travel restrictions. And we especially pray for the, the ongoing work in Liberia and for your guidance uh, about a decision to uh, reschedule uh, work that was supposed to happen there in March uh, for uh, the end of August. Lord, in your mercy. Dear Lord, we know there are so many people around the world facing health concerns. We remember each of them and trust in you to care for them. But we particularly lift up uh, those members of our congregation and those who are near to our church family who have special health concerns. We pray today for Bishop, Frida, Peyton, Emerson, Mike, Holly, Jane, Joyce, Bonnie, Katie, Bart, Janine, Mary, Elizabeth, and all others who we name now in the silence of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. It's your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now let us join together in the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated.
according to your word, for our eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have protected us through the night from all danger and harm. We ask you to preserve us and keep us this day also from all sin and evil, that in all our thoughts, words, and deeds, we may serve and please you. Into your hands we commend our bodies and souls and all that is ours. Let your holy angels have charge of us, that the wicked one have no power over us. Amen. May the Lord bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord.